Hello and welcome to Conversations. We're going to be having a conversation with Chris Ferris. He's a musician, singer, songwriter, sound tech, producer. Chris, thank you so much for being on the program here. God, all those hats, man, make my head feel heavy already. <laughs> well, is there, any, is there anything I missed? Oh my gosh, sure. Um, we, we all have a handful of things. I'm also a handyman. Uh, I'm also um, an avid beach person. You know, we could all list a thousand things that we're into. But no, you got the major ones. You got the major yes, ones. for okay. sure. Right, because you, um, so, I mean, this has been, what a crazy couple of years this has been. Um, yeah, it's hard to be uh, prolific and productive when this kind of stuff is going on. Yeah. Sure. I'm amazed that we've managed to keep pushing through, but it also, for a, I'm sure for a lot of us, feels like somebody hit the pause button, you know, and we've all been kind of drifting. Mm -hmm. And I, would, I hope we get out of that feeling that things are just kind of floating. One of the things I was actually just about to touch on was the music industry has certainly been, especially for, I mean, you've, uh, you know, played around town and at different bars mm -hmm. and different gigs and things like that, especially probably in the early years of, early months of 2020 when things were really just absolutely shut down. I mean, can you tell me what that, what that was like for musicians around the area? Well, I, you know, I can't tell you for everybody, but I did kind of see that there was like a, uh, a split. I think, and this is just my opinion, that, that a lot of the younger musicians who are technology wise knew exactly what to do, and that was to go to online stuff, to do the cyber gigs, to get on Facebook, that kind of thing. For me, and maybe some of my generation who aren't so comfortable with that technology or so educated on how to make it work, it was like, um, do I really want to invest all that time and equipment? That maybe it's not going to last very long, but here we are two years later. So um, for some people, I think it was a boon because it pushed them in a different direction and it kept their faces and their music out in front of people. For, for me, and maybe some of my generation, we were kind of trying to figure out what to do. Some of us got around to the cyber stuff, but me, I only did one or two and I didn't invest in any of my own equipment. I just couldn't see myself sitting in my bedroom playing to a camera <laughs> and getting anything out of that. So. It's been interesting. Uh, so for, for those who are really, you know, technologi technologically uh, adept and have that drive, they, they're still out there. They're still good. They're still producing stuff. And when things pick back up, they'll be able to just slide back in, mm -hmm. I think. Um, and now you're still playing gigs yes, so semi-regularly now? Rarely, I'm, especially during the winter with COVID. I am trying to stay in places that either have enough social distancing or at least some kind of openness to them. I don't want to be in a small closed space and unfortunately a lot of the gigs that I do are in smaller kind of wine bar or small restaurant kind of things. Okay, well when you, when you were, you were playing what mostly, uh, Greensboro, Oak Ridge area? Yep, um, I, ne I never was one to travel, a lot of that to begin with was because I was a father and a single father and um, I didn't want to be taken off and leaving my daughter for lengths of time or whatever. Uh, so I wanted to stay here and you know, I brought her to gigs and she grew up alongside of me and that kind of thing. And fortunately for me, I was able to stay busy enough just in this area that I didn't have to do too much wandering around. Of course, I was playing cover gigs if you're an original musician, you're not so fortunate there. You have to move around because the places, especially back early when I was here in the 90s, they were few and far between that understood original music and would let you play. So that's why those people had to keep branching out and traveling just to find the places to play. It's much more prominent now, I think. It's a, it's a much more uh, regular thing to have local uh, artists, local musicians playing at, uh, at, at your bar, at your restaurant, or whatever it is? Yes, but I think if you ask most musicians who are doing any kind of cover work plus originals, 
they would probably tell you that half the time they don't really tell people that they're originals. At least I wouldn't. I would kind of slip one or two in and then just keep moving along. And then if somebody asked, hey, well, I don't recognize that song you did in that last set. What was that? Then I would say, oh, well, that's one I wrote. Because some, for some reason to me, if you're looking at a crowd and you say, I'm going to play an original, it's like, oh, OK, we'll be back with you in five minutes when you come back to something we know. <laughs> so you kind of setting yourself up to get ignored a little bit. Uh, so I just kind of slide them in. And I would bet a lot of musicians do. And I guess it is something of, um, you know, you, you do have to be a little, you do have to be a little gutsy to, you know, number one, play in front of people, but number two, you know, play, have, especially announce that you're, this is your own original work, this is yours. Absolutely. You have to have a certain amount of confidence, a certain amount of ego. It it's just comes with the territory. I mean, if you're going to grab people and bring them to you, you have to do that first thing, which is get over that uh, feeling uh, of um, hesitancy. You have to be confident in yourself, and you have to know they're going to like this, and I'm going to play it, and I'm going to show them. So yeah, it takes a lot of courage. So you've been playing since you were uh, 17? Oh, no. Before that? Well, professionally, yes, okay. 17, yes. I mean, I started playing guitar at 11, but yeah. What was it that, um, you said you were, uh, I heard the story that you were, you were listening to the radio with your father, mm -hmm. and something hit you. You said, how does that, uh, how does that, how, did, yeah, how do you we make were that just, sound? It was just a, a day, an average day. We're driving in the car. I don't know why. I can't remember for the life of me what song it was. I'm sh you know, I wish I could remember. But there was a sound uh, that came and it hit me, and I was like, Dad, what is that, or stepfather, what is that, um, what makes that sound? And he said, well, that's the electric guitar. And I said, oh, wow, that's cool. And I guess later on, there were more discussions, and I kind of let him know that I wanted to learn how to play the guitar. But I do, that moment just always stuck with me, and I really wish I could remember what song it was. <laughs> You know, that would help the story a lot. Now, well, how old were you when you had this uh, Well, moment? if I started playing uh, or taking lessons at 11, this was probably 10-ish somewhere. Yeah, because it was a while before I actually started taking lessons. We were living in the Bahamas at that time. There wasn't a music store there. It's like, not like you could go down the street and grab a guitar and start playing. And um, it took a while to find a music teacher, even. I think he it was a... Uh, chiropractor who happened to know how to play guitar or something. It was, it was kind of bizarre. <laughs> As I remember him always saying, because um, I remember I came into lessons one day and my, my neck was a little stiff and he said, well, I can take care of that too, you know. <laughs> I'm thinking, no, let's just stick to guitar. <laughs> Here's my card. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's amazing. So, yeah. Um, so where did you go from there? Did you end up like in a school band, or did you end up playing with you know, like you know regular bands on the side? Or the other part of that story is I took lessons, classical lessons, for about a year, and just hated it. Um, classical music didn't do anything for me. Um, I guess I should have asked this chiropractor why. I mean, was it? Was classical music the only music he knew, or did he feel like I needed to learn that first? Anyway, I didn't. So I told my stepfather, I, I got to quit. I, I can't take this anymore. I'm, I just, I'm bored to death with it. And he said, well, you can stop taking lessons, but every day after school for 30 minutes before you do anything else, you're going to sit in your room and you're going to play that guitar. I don't care if it's one note or 10 notes or what. Your mom's there, she's gonna let me know that you're doing what I told you. And I did that long enough until I met some other kids in school, uh, different musicians, one was a drummer, one was a, another guitar player. And we started talking and then we started jamming together. And that's all it took was getting to that 
human connection with other musicians, and I was on my way. And this was, let's see, middle school. So we were horrible, but we thought we were great. <laughs> We were doing Rolling Stones or trying to do Rolling Stones music. And actually, as it turned out, because there was another guitar player, I ended up for a while switching and playing bass, which came pretty easily because it's just the bottom four strings of a guitar anyway. I mean, maybe a bass player back then would have looked at me and said, no, you're not playing bass, but I made it work. And uh, my stepfather, actually, I had a Fender Bassman head that I got somewhere, and he actually built a speaker cabinet for it for me. So it was a, it was a fun time mm -hmm. for music. You know, there was no, no rules. We just played, and we jammed, and we thought we were great. And that was all it took to get that seed going and fuel things for me. And you also had really good music coming out at the time, too. Yes, it, but I wasn't in the Bahamas. I wasn't exposed to that immediately. Um, I don't think there was a radio station that we could get regularly. The music that we got at home was LPs, local, and a lot of it was ska, calypso, reggae, um, all that kind of stuff, South American. Cuban, um, yeah, so it was a real mishmash of stuff. And then eventually, I remember my parents would listen, they would catch a lot of R&B and that kind of stuff that they would get bought and brought over from the United States. Um, so yeah, the, I didn't, my first Beatles album was the White Album. <laughs> Wasn't that the last album? Yeah, exactly, the last yes, album? yeah. So, you know, I was really behind the times on all the stuff that was out there. And I had a whole lot of exploring to do once I was aware. Um, my, my biggest musical moment was, I, <laughs> it's a kind of funny story. I went to a, I was invited to a party by a girl that I really liked. And I thought she invited me because she really liked me. Well, that wasn't true. So in my deje dejection, I moped off and I went around the corner and on this table was a record player and there was one LP on the record player. So I just plopped it down, stuck the needle on it and let it play. Well, it, it was the uh, Sweet Baby James album, James Taylor. Well, I tell you what, I went home and I figured out a way to get that album and I learned every song on that album. I just, I, I guess it was the the mood that that whole party left me in and the way that album hit me, I just kind of sequestered myself and I just learned that whole thing. It was very interesting. Right. Um, I remember listening to Bruce Springsteen's um, book, audio book. He talked about how rock and roll is absolutely hard work and I think that's what you were kind of getting at was with the, the um, you know, the half hour after school and how, I mean, about how long did it take you to learn that, the James Taylor album? It took me months, probably. You know, I wouldn't listen to it every single day, but it was my entire focus. No matter what this little band we were, whatever we were learning there, I, I was still doing that. But when I was alone in, that, in my room, I was pulling that album apart you know I was playing over and over again and you know just really dissecting every song but you know there's a, a theory out there that if you're gonna be good at something it's you have 10,000 hours at it so figure that out how many days that is <laughs> 10,000 hours average what 2,000 a year people average 50 weeks 40 hours a week so that's five five years at least, yeah. of solid practice. Well, you hear stories about musicians that play for hours every day. They go to bed with the guitar or whatever next to them. I mean, literally, to get to a certain level, that's what it takes. I wasn't that kind of person. I mean, I gave it enough to give me back what I needed. Um, and maybe if I had pushed harder, I could have 
Maybe I could have gotten a record deal. I don't know. Um, I've done a lot of writing in, in my time. Um, but I never, I didn't want to be famous. That wasn't my thing. It was just making music, just that creating whatever that was. That was what drove me more than anything. Was there any reason you just didn't, you didn't want to? I guess because, <clears throat> excuse me, to me, as I was becoming more aware of being famous stardom or whatever, um, it's this kind of thing. Uh, the going up is great. The however long you last at the top is great, but it gets more and more stressful because everybody else is coming after you that wants to be number one. I didn't want to be there, and I certainly didn't want to be there at the bottom either because that destroyed a lot of lives. That wasn't fun to me. I, I, I tell people now, whether it's true or not, um, <clears throat> I've had a 40-some-odd-year career of pretty much nice uh, things, mm -hmm. and I haven't had that stress of being at the top and wondering how I'm going to stay there or the dejection of being at the bottom where everybody's forgotten you. Mm -hmm. I've been right there floating in the middle, you know, doing my thing. So to me, that's fine. Right, because I think, at least the way I've seen it, you know, is the amount of... Um, you know, stress, the amount of pressure, and the amount of uh, temptation, if you will, yes. is absolutely, uh, yeah. it, it's beyond belief, you know, drugs, I've watched drinking. so many documentaries. Yeah, rockumentaries on, yes, yeah. that guys have just really driven themselves into the ground, chasing after something that ended up destroying them. Mm -hmm. And I, that just didn't sound like any fun for yeah. me, you know? Yeah, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, like Amy Winehouse, exactly. for example, was, yeah. uh, you know. Yes. She, you know, just uh, one of those tragic stories, I guess, you know, just beautiful musician. Just Of course, and then on the other hand, there's Paul McCartney, who's still playing yep. at 80 years, almost 80 years old, and still writing, and still just as uh, um, relevant as he was in the 60s. So there's both ends of the scale. I'm not a Paul McCartney. <laughs> And I certainly don't want to be an Amy Winehouse, so I'm kind of good where I am. <laughs> um, so you came to, <coughs> jumping off of that, you, so you came to Greensboro in 94? Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, what drew you here? Did you come directly from the Bahamas here? What? No, um, it was kind of a circuitous route. Um, from the Bahamas, I, we moved back to Florida. I graduated high school there, and I was just hell-bent on getting out of there because when you're 17 living in retirement land, <laughs> it's the last place you want to be. So I moved to Atlanta. I lived in Atlanta for 15 years and really got musically going there. Um, was with one band called Source, which was very regional, but we were all original and we were, Warner Brothers was knocking on our door, but our keyboard player quit right at the edge of signing. So that just blew that whole thing out of the water. So move on. Um, I decided I'd go get a legitimate job. I went to work for Sarah Lee. Sarah Lee moved me to South Carolina. South Carolina sucked. No, no offense, South Carolinians. Um, sucked for me. <laughs> um, ran into a guy who had a small company here that needed somebody to go to work for him. And I said, I'm there. I didn't know a soul when I got here in 94. I just had to get out of South, South Carolina, so I'm here. I'm uh, looking around, I'm trying to figure out what I'm gonna do. I start wandering around downtown and just start looking for gigs. Got going, I played at a little coffee shop down on um, Elm Street, it's not there anymore. It was called Perks Coffee and More. Back in 95, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And Greensboro at the time, I mean, what was your impression of Greensboro at the time when you got here? Well, after Atlanta, it seemed like a, a, a livable place because it wasn't huge. But after South Carolina, it was refreshing for me. Because um, I was just outside of Spartanburg, actually Gaffney, South Carolina. 
it was a little more rural, rural, that's a hard word for me to say, rural, than I liked. So this was a kind of good balance between, yeah, you could go 15 minutes and be in the country, but you felt like you were in a, a city at the same time. So I liked it here. I liked the atmosphere. I liked, I met artsy people right away. I thought, okay, I can do this, you know, these are my people. So I liked it. I mean, this is the longest I've lived anywhere in my life. So it says a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Greensboro has changed a lot since you've been here. Maybe physically it has, or geographically it has. I don't know that it's changed a lot to me otherwise. Mm -hmm. How you mean you, as far as the people or culturally? Right. I, I, I still kind of get pretty much the same feeling about the place. Yeah. I don't think it's, every place changes on the outside. I, I think that the vibe of the city is still pretty much for me what it was before. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course you were still doing music when you were here. You did uh, Windfall not too long after that. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually didn't get together till 2000. Um, kind of on a, it was, we all ended up, the three of us ended up at a party. We were invited to a party. And I think Jimmy brought his guitar. I don't know if I brought mine. And it, however it happened, we, three of us sat down and somebody said, well, try to figure out a song. So we sat there for a few minutes and we put together something and, and people were like, wow, that sounds really good. So we left out of the party going, hmm, <laughs> maybe we should uh, follow this up a little bit and see what happens. And uh, so we did, we got together and we rehearsed. And before you know it, we were playing. We threw a few songs on a tape and got around town and Played for like almost 20 years together. Wow. Yeah, just active in different places. And this must have been, I mean, uh, making work and everything like that, this must have been um, interesting for you, you know, trying to learn the community in that way. Yeah, I was, um, you kind of almost learn it without realizing what you're doing. I mean, just you search for places to play, then you got to find that place, you got to go talk to that person, and then you make that connection, and that connection leads to this and that, and you're finding yourself all over the area over time. And before you know it, you have a whole address book full of people that are associates now. So, I, you know, I've thought recently that I'd like to go somewhere else, maybe not live here the rest of my life. But if I did that, could I start from scratch again? And that's not a very um, enticing thought. I don't know if I have that ambition <laughs> or that stamina now to go out and make all those connections again and recreate that community. So I don't know, it's, um, it's a valuable thing. I've been here long enough, and it's taken me a long time to get the good friends that I have. Mm. So I don't know if I want to jeopardize all that. It's interesting. I feel like you've been kind of, you've, you've always had to kind of do that, though, haven't you? You know, coming from Maine to the Bahamas to Atlanta. You, I feel like you've always had to grow a, a community within your, within yeah. your circle, I guess. And, you know, there's been times in my life where I've, called myself a man without a country. <laughs> uh, my family is very dysfunctional and very out of touch with each other. So the whole concept of family is something that I don't see the same as a lot of other people. Therefore, my friends are my family. Um, and yes, every time you transplant yourself, you have to create a new family. But that takes a certain amount of uh, energy and uh, drive and confidence to go out and do that. And how many times can you repeat that in your life? You know, where do you, where do you say, okay, I think Simple. I better stick right where I am because uh, I don't know if I can recreate this again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sort of start yes. your own roots, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have deeper roots here than I have anywhere else. So, but you still have kind of a, a heart for the, uh, the Caribbean, and that's where, is this where Caribbean fantasy came from? Mm -hmm. Breathe.
Yeah, um, that song I wrote in Atlanta back in the 90s, I guess, before I moved to South Carolina. It was written, it started in my head. I was driving home from work in a van, and I was like, am I going to remember this when I get home? And I kept trying to repeat it and repeat it in my brain until I got home and I could write it down and grab the guitar and get it out if I could. Um, but yeah, I, I love the ocean. I love the whole... The, the slow, casual feeling of uh, tropical vacation kind of places. Even the, the shore at North Carolina for me would be fine. Um, I could do that. Uh, yeah, I like that kind of stuff. I grew up around it. I mean, even though I was born in Maine, my whole uh, growing awareness of life happened in the Bahamas on that island. So. And I'm sure that that resonates with the people that live there too, is how they, um, I guess that culture and how they behave or... It, I'd like to think so. I don't know. I don't know. I'm at, that's, I guess that's my question is, is that how, that's what I, I perceive it as. But I don't know how there. I would feel if I went back to Freeport, Grand Bahama today. I mean, if, I'm sure I'd feel the same way walking on the beach. Would I feel the same way about living there? I don't know. It's been so long. Uh, it will probably feel, and I'm sure look, very different than what I remember. So that's, um, it's just a nice, a nice little dream to keep in the back of your head. Now what's, uh, do you have anything on the, other than the Caribbean that's floating around in the back of your head, is there anything on the horizon for you that uh, you have plans, ambitions, um, ideas? No, I, like I said, I feel like my life is floating right now. Um, I've done a good many things here in town. Um, I've played. I've done, I, we were talking about Beat Street, the show that uh, Windfall did, which showcased music. I have did some time at the Creative Center. I don't know if you remember the Creative Center on 16th Street with Sue Sassman. And oh, yeah. Yeah, I did the um, showcase of original music there, which is an open mic for original music. Ha and then I did two years of shows, produced shows, and Melody Watson helped me with that. So, um, and then I, you know, I'm still gigging. I'm trying to figure out if there is anything else that I feel like I need to do. I'm kind of, I'm kind of happy just letting things slow down. <laughs> well, that's about all the time we have. Is there anything you want to add? Well, I feel yeah. like I've already talked too much. Anyway. Oh no, not at all, <laughs> Todd. I haven't even. We haven't even gotten into everything that we possibly could have. <laughs> well, then we'll just have to have a part two. <laughs> we will have to have a part two. Thank you so much, Chris, for being on. Well, I appreciate, appreciate you your inviting time. me. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, man. That. <laughs>